Um, so my name is, is Tom, Thomas Lorenzo. I'm a faculty member here. I'm going to be the chair for this session. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, which is Jennifer. Jennifer Gradecki uh, is an artist and theorist investigating information as a source of power and resistance, aiming to facilitate a critical or practice-based understanding of social technical systems that typically evade public scrutiny. She has worked on institutional review boards, uh, financial instruments, and technologies of mass surveillance. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, she holds an MFA from UCLA and is a PhD candidate in visual studies at SUNY at Buffalo. She is currently a Dean's Research Fellow at Northeastern for data storytelling. She has participated in, in numerous uh, international exhibitions and conferences, including Ars Electronica, New Media Gallery, AC Institute, the New Gallery, Isaiah, and Radical Networks, among others. And her work has been commissioned by Science Gallery Dublin and funded by the Puffin Foundation. So please welcome Jennifer. I'm going to uh, sure request that I have the lights uh, down, so don't fall asleep. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay? All right, excellent. So I just first of all wanted to say that I'm really excited to be here and I have really enjoyed this conference so far and I'm excited to continue to hear other people's presentations. It's been really inspiring and, am I loud enough? Okay, I have this tendency to be, okay. I can either be really loud or, or soft-spoken. All right, so today I'm gonna be talking about machine learning and data valence practices through an artistic research project and I wanted to state at the outset that the project is a collaboration with Derek Curry, who's gonna be speaking after me. Um, so frequently I will say we, and by we, I mean Derek Curry and I. So I wanted to start with some background and context. This project in many ways began in 2012. Derek Curry and I were first year PhD students at the State University of New York at Buffalo and we were driving to an art history conference in Montreal to present our research. We arrived at the Canadian border, the agent greeted us politely, took our passports, scanned them, and looked into his computer. It was all very routine. Then his entire demeanor changed. He sternly ordered us to park our car and head into the station. We were separated and interrogated, and the agents kept coming back to the same question for both of us. Are you sure you've never been arrested? It was clear that the agents didn't know why they were interrogating us. They knew we had been flagged as threats, but they didn't have access to all the data in our files. We were eventually able to enter the country, and as we drove to Montreal, we tried to figure out why we had ended up on a watch list. It occurred to us that it must have been our affiliation with the Occupy movement. We weren't central to the movement. We didn't have much time to be at the encampment, but some of our friends were very involved and we knew that intelligence and law enforcement were very concerned about Occupy. We had the FOIA files to prove it. After the release of the Snowden leaks, it got easier for us to cross borders as debates about data valence entered into the public discourse. We also couldn't be dismissed as conspiracy theorists when we talked about it anymore. Unfortunately, however, people who are unfamiliar with techniques for data collection and analysis often don't understand how large troves of unstructured data and metadata become intelligence. Sometimes they assume that if they have nothing to hide, these systems shouldn't concern them. Because of this, data valence of publicly available information hasn't been scrutinized as much in terms of privacy um, to the extent that the bulk collection of emails or cell phone data has. Part of what impedes a public understanding of mass surveillance is the rise of big data and the analytical tools to process it. The public doesn't have access to the same amount of data that intelligence agencies do. But even when the public does gain access to massive troves of data, they generally don't have the computational capacity to quickly process and analyze all of it, or the time to develop the competencies to understand these intentionally coded and specialized documents. Lev Manovich created a hierarchy of data classes for a big data society, and at the top are people and organizations with the expertise to analyze big data. The middle class is comprised of those who can collect big data, 
and at the bottom are those who only make data consciously or not. Vian Bakir argues that the current civic infrastructure for genuine public debate, debate over mass surveillance is too weak to facilitate change from below. Her assessment is that when it comes to surveillance, quote, making people understand and care about such issues is challenging given their abstract, complex nature, unquote. We agree and would add to this list the inability of citizens to either collect or process big data. The data valence practices employed by intelligence agencies are spawned from a collected all mentality that assumes that if enough data can be collected, future actions can be predicted. The amount of data currently being collected and processed requires tools developed for handling such large data sets. This toolkit includes instruments for data capture, as well as software that scans massive troves of unstructured data, returning elements determined to be suspicious through an algorithmic process. For the last 20 years, intelligence agencies have been developing and refining large-scale automated data gathering and processing software in order to address the growing problem of data deluge or ever-growing data sets. Today, intelligence agencies process massive amounts of structured and unstructured data derived from both private and public sources, including financial, medical, professional and academic records, transactional data, search queries, texts, emails, telephony metadata, geographic information system data, public records, social media posts, websites and blogs, news articles, video, audio, images, and the list goes on and on. But big data and intelligence analysis consists mainly of public data. In 2004, it was estimated that over 80% of the intelligence database was comprised of open source information. The number of people using social media has grown substantially since 2004, so it's likely that this percentage is even higher today. Agencies feel the need to automate this process of looking at this disparate data in order to gain situational awareness and predict outcomes. With the CSIA, we were interested in understanding how this process of automation impacts the conclusions that intelligence agents come to. So next, I wanted to describe the project in more detail. The Crowdsource Intelligence Agency is an online application and interactive installation that replicates and displays some of the known techniques used by intelligence agencies to collect and process open source information. We use technical manuals, research reports, academic papers, leaked documents, and FOIA files to build an open source intelligence or OSINT system that's accessible to the public. An OSINT is intelligence that's gathered from publicly available sources like social media, academic articles, and other public data. The goal of the project is to expose the potential problems, assumptions, and oversights that are inherent in current data valence systems to help people understand the effectiveness of OSINT processing and its impact on our privacy. There have been several variations of this installation and in this image is a public terminal that we created by turning a storefront window into an interface using capacitative touch sensors. This terminal was installed in Boulder, Colorado as part of the Media Live event at the Boulder MoCA. Quick Left, as you'll see in the image, uh, is a startup that let it, us use their storefront window for the duration of the exhibition. Another public terminal was simultaneously installed in Athens, Greece for the Athens Digital Art Festival. Users of the public terminal could evaluate tweets on a watch list made of Twitter accounts for the curators and other artists that were participating in both of these events with us. There were QR codes that people could scan that would allow them to add Twitter accounts to the watch list. And we found that the public terminal was a great way to interact with people and to tell them what we knew about OSINT surveillance. So next I wanted to show a brief informational video that provides an introduction to the project. We now know that our social media posts are being read by intelligence agents who sometimes say that it doesn't matter, that we have nothing to hide but we don't really know what they're looking for. What's it like to be an intelligence agent? 
and look at what people post. How do you know what someone really meant if you don't know them and you only have 140 characters to go on? What little we do know comes from leaked files, technical manuals, and documents released through Freedom of Information Act requests. And sometimes when the system fails, there's a story in the media. Like the two British students who were denied entry into the U.S. and threatened to destroy America and dig up Marilyn Monroe. Or super joking. Or the trial of the Boston bomber, where there's ample physical evidence linking Sarno to the crime. With the social media evidence presented by the FBI heard their case. Some lyrics and jokes were presented as threats. And the FBI had thought that a photograph of a mosque in Bosnia was Mecca. They didn't even bother to look at a picture of Mecca. Computers running machine learning algorithms can automate this process and label tens of thousands of posts per second. But if there are mistakes in the data used to train the algorithm, those mistakes will simply be replicated. How does the presentation of data affect how an intelligence analyst interprets it? How does metadata change what an intelligence analyst thinks when they see a social media post? What's it like to be on the other side of the screen? So the app has several components. The social media monitor, which is a surveillance interface where users evaluate tweets based on their threat to national security. And in the top left of the interface, um, you can see that the CSIA agents or users of the app have access to the tweet's metadata and the reasons that the tweet was selected. After evaluating the metadata in the tweet, users can label the tweet as non-threatening threatening or they can flag it for follow-up by other analysts if they aren't sure how to evaluate it. Another component to the project are multiple Naive Bayes supervised machine learning classifiers that label tweets as suspicious or not. 
All of our classifiers use a naive Bayes algorithm, but each classifier is trained on a different corpus. The crowdsource classifier is trained on a corpus labeled by visitors to Science Gallery Dublin's secret exhibition, where over 16,000 tweets were rated. The terrorism classifier is trained on tweets from the accounts of known terrorist organizations, such as ISIS and Boko Haram. The intelligence agency classifier is trained on tweets from the official Twitter accounts of intelligence agencies. And then the Agent Bayes classifier is trained on a corpus of tweets that I manually labeled after researching and simulating the process and judgments of intelligence analysts. CSIA agents provide feedback on the accuracy and idiosyncrasies of the predictions. There's also the social media post inspector where users can enter and submit text to see if a social media post is likely to be considered threatening by intelligence agencies and before they share it on social media. And there is a watch list where users can target themselves and their friends as subjects of social media monitoring. They can also see the automated evaluations from our machine learning classifiers. Um, again, in the top left in the metadata, you can see that there are evaluations from both Agent Bayes, whoops, sorry about that, and the crowdsource classifier. I seem to have lost my, okay, I think I have to go this way, got it. Um, and in this instance, the two algorithms disagree. The watch list shows how social media posts may be treated by OSINT surveillance systems. And again, feedback on the algorithms is collected from participants. And in the bottom right of the interface, you can indicate the factors that informed your decisions. And then finally, there's the resource library, which links to the many documents that informed the creation of the app. Next, I wanted to talk briefly about some of the assumptions that I've found in my investigations of the intelligence process. Many of the assumptions of intelligence analysts can be traced back to the technical metaphors that they use to understand their work. The mosaic metaphor has had the most impact of any informational metaphor. And this is the notion that combining seemingly insignificant pieces of information when combined, of course, can lead to unforeseen insights and potentially produce a damaging picture. It has shaped Freedom of Information Act law, limiting what is allowed to be made public in national security cases, and it's impacted how intelligence gathering is understood and practiced. It's been used to validate mass arrests, mass surveillance, and indefinite detention. Shortly after it was first used in FOIA law in the 70s, the mosaic theory quickly became connected with the computational capacity to aggregate large amounts of data. The mosaic metaphor leads to a collect it all mentality and the construction of data retention centers. Because any piece of information could potentially be useful in a mosaic, agencies feel like they have to collect it all and they have to process it all in order to construct a complete picture. This drives the mass collection of data and produces information overload, which in turn leads agencies to automate the analytical process using surveillance software and machine learning algorithms. One assumption held by intelligence analysts is illustrated in the example of Tsarnaev. Intelligence analysts assume that open source information from threatening individuals contains indications of their plans. This assumption relies upon the logical fallacy of hindsight bias. It's premised on the belief that if someone is a known threat to national security, evidence of their intentions would have been available all along, and this evidence could have been pieced together to prevent an attack. Intelligence agents use this logic when they attempt to go back and connect the dots or build a mosaic, analyzing OSINT for indications of intentions. Analysts also tend to assume that data is raw and unprocessed, an indexical trace that directly corresponds to activities in the world. Data is understood to be the raw building block of intelligence, and as you can see in this diagram, intelligence analysts believe in a traditional data information knowledge hierarchy where data are processed to produce intelligence and then information is the raw material for intelligence. In the concept of raw data, the context for its creation is edited out. It doesn't factor in the knowledge required to collect data or the ways that data is shaped by certain practices. Many theorists, on the other hand, have argued for a reversal of this hierarchy 
And the argument here is that data do not emerge on their own as isolated facts, but are created using prior knowledge and shaped by certain practices. Data are not pre-analytical, but cooked. They are processed prior to reaching the analyst by choices that are made, like what should be captured and how the database should be formatted. Another assumption is that more data is better. Intelligence analysts are afraid they're not sharing enough information with each other, and they simultaneously feel like they're drowning in too much information, struggling to process it all and make meaning out of noise. This collect it all and share it all approach has resulted in too much data for human analysts to process. Information overload leads many intelligence analysts to assume that if only they could collect and process all of the data using big data analytics, then the data would be able to speak for themselves, free of theory. And there's a lot of evidence that intelligence analysts are generally skeptical of theory. Booz Allen Hamilton reflects this assumption in their field guide to data science when they state that the key to performing data science is understanding the data you have and what the data inductively tells you. The logic is that software will find meaningful patterns that human analysts can't perceive, and if agents can process all the data, they'll be able to produce more accurate predictions, which is central to their practice. It starts to become clear that the assumptions held by intelligence analysts make them susceptible to big data myths. This is compounded by the fact that epistemology is rarely discussed in the intelligence literature. And this finally brings us to Next Generation Information Access, or NGIA systems, which automate the role of the analyst performing value-added content processing to massive continual flows of information. Tech companies develop and pitch these technologies to the intelligence community as so-called smart systems that provide various automated functions for the analyst. They collect, process, and analyze data. They generate reports and allow for customization, such as watch lists and predictions. Companies boast that they can combine structured and unstructured data from many sources. Troves of supposedly raw OSINT are processed and analyzed to find hidden patterns, allowing the data to inductively reveal hidden truths. And this brings us to one of our main contributions to, contribu or to conversations about OSINT, which is machine learning and data valence. Naive Bayes classification, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is nothing more than a statistical comparison of features from a test case to features in a model. In the case of social media posts, the features are the words used and possible word pairings. Naive Bayes is the machine learning classifier that is most commonly used by intelligence agencies because it assumes independence among features. Analysts only need to know that something is a threat to include it in a Naive Bayes training corpus. They don't necessarily need to know why it is a threat. Since intelligence agencies are usually working with incomplete information, Naive Bayes is an obvious choice. But not knowing why something might be a threat can produce problems like false positives. People who believe they won't be targeted by surveillance systems because they're not doing anything wrong need to understand that automated classification systems only find statistical correlations between data. If you happen to make posts that use language that is similar to a known target, you may be flagged as a potential threat by the system. Since we don't have access to the data that intelligence analysts use to train their classifiers, we created our own classifiers for the CSIA. For some of them, we simply took all of the tweets from Twitter accounts associated with a certain classification, like terrorist organizations, or, um, um, and made them into a corpus. We also used ratings from CSIA users to make a corpus. During the secret exhibition at Science Gallery Dublin, anyone who visited the gallery could review Twitter posts and rate them based on their threat to national security. And here are some of our CSIA agents at work. And this became the corpus of tweets that we used to make our crowdsource classifier. This is the distribution for the crowdsource classifier made by visitors to the secret exhibition. The majority of tweets were found to be not a threat. In order to have something to compare the crowdsource classifier against, I made a separate corpus by manually labeling tweets myself. I read ethnographic reports about how intelligence agents make decisions and I diligently replicated their process. 
and my machine learning classifier became Agent Bayes. To train Agent Bayes, I rated thousands of tweets that were swept up based on keywords used by the Department of Homeland Security to automate social media monitoring. Posts were flagged if they contained DDoS or attack. It was difficult for me to decide if a tweet was suspicious or not. This was partially because I hated taking on this role, but it was also because I was trying to replicate what an intelligence analyst would do rather than what I would do. Based on leaked documents and ethnographic reports, we know that since 9-11, analysts are afraid that they might overlook something that indicates a threat, so they tend to err on the side of caution. I looked for references to groups and individuals that are targeted by intelligence agencies, like Occupy, Anonymous, Antisex, Snowden, Assange, and so on. It's clear that intelligence agencies are against the use of encryption, so it's safe to assume that people who are vocal about encryption would be targeted. And we know that sarcasm, parody, and pop cultural references may not be recognized. So I took all of this into consideration as I rated these tweets. We tested a data set that hadn't been used to train either corpus and fed it into both classifiers. To our surprise, the results were extremely similar. The crowdsource classifier found 22.11% of the tweets to be suspicious, and Agent Bayes found 21.49% to be suspicious. This is extremely close. So we compared the actual decisions each classifier made to see if the two classifiers agreed with each other. And it turns out that they disagree with each other about 35% of the time, which is a significant margin of error if you're going to use this as evidence in a court of law or potentially not let someone into a country. One of the problems we experience that's common to machine learning classifiers is overfitting. Overfitting is the result of a bad training corpus, a corpus that contains identifying information that you don't want or is an unclear instance of something that you do want to find. These are the vectors for the naive Bayes classifier made from the data that was tagged by the visitors to Science Gallery Dublin. Notice that Guinness is one of the vectors, about four lines down. Uh, when we looked at the data, it turned out that about two-thirds of the times Guinness was mentioned, it was referencing Martin McGuinness. And McGuinness was a prominent IRA member who became the first deputy minister of Northern Ireland. So for citizens of Dublin, this you know, could have been seen as a, le a legitimate threat. Now, if you're an intelligence analyst using an automated system where the classifier is black boxed, you wouldn't have access to this underlying data and may simply assume that drinking Guinness leads to nefarious behavior. Um, but if we go back to the example of the Boston bomber and the FBI's misinterpretation of his posts, we can conclude that the FBI, knowing that there was physical evidence linking Zarnayev to the bombing, assumed that his Twitter posts were incriminating. If the social media posts made by known terrorists are labeled as threatening, and used in a machine learning classifier, training corpus, we can expect to find Twitter users with a similar taste in pop culture being algorithmically identified as threats to national security. I should mention that it was later learned that Zarnayev had a separate Twitter account under a pseudonym where he posted his more extremist views. And we can also go back to the example of the two British students who were detained by the Department of Homeland Security and denied entry into the US for their Twitter posts in 2012. These are their tweets here. The tweet on the right is a quote from the cartoon dog Brian from the TV series Family Guy. The tweet on the left is using slang, what they mean by destroy is party. And these posts were misidentified as threats by the DHS. They were searched for shovels and spades before they were sent back to the UK. <laughs> So how does machine learning detect threats? It doesn't. It only detects patterns in language. If you say something similar to what a terrorist says, the machine learning algorithm might flag your post. The main point here is that machine learning systems will automate mistakes if they're trained on erroneous data. If you have flawed data, it doesn't matter how good your algorithm is. We should explore the possibility that statistical correlation is not the best way to find threats in every case. People are not easily reducible to one thing. Not everything a terrorist says or does is indicative of a terrorist plot. Um, and it's likely they'll try to hide their intentions if they're up to something. 
So using a naive Bayes classifier may not be the best approach here. If most of what a terrorist says on social media has nothing to do with terrorist plots, the training set will be polluted with erroneous data. Next, I'd like to mention another final aspect of OSINT systems that we've been exploring, and that is visual representation. OSINT systems depend on the arrangement and visual presentation of data to create meaning. The creation of meaning through visual representation is the domain of artists, art historians, designers, as well as cultural and visual theorists. This opens up a space for creative practitioners to analyze and critique these technologies. Tools developed through critiques of representation allow us to read OSINT systems differently to gain insights into this way of knowing. Cultural and visual studies theorists have described the effects that the addition of text may have on the way a viewer perceives an image. In Ways of Seeing, John Berger demonstrates how words attached to an image can change the meaning of that image, using the example of Van Gogh's wheat field with crows. The viewer is first presented with only the image, and on the following page, the image is accompanied by this text. This is the last picture Van Gogh painted before he killed himself. The text has changed the image, even if it may be difficult to describe exactly what those changes are. In a similar way, in the context of an OSINT system, keywords, agent reviews, and machine learning predictions can function as labels or captions that direct analysts to see social media posts and their authors as threatening or not, changing and shaping the meaning that's produced. Similarly, juxtaposition, placing two or more images or objects next to one another, is an artistic strategy used to emphasize certain qualities by contrast and comparison. Berger argues that the meaning of an image is changed by what it is seen immediately beside or immediately after it. The arrangement of images or data objects in an OSINT interface can produce meaning based on placement and the associations produced by juxtaposition. This can be seen in the CSIA when an analyst sees a tweet in the context of other tweets, some of which clearly represent threats. Do similarities and differences between social media posts invite associations that lead analysts to judge them as threatening or not? I'm gonna conclude by discussing public oversights and a means for intervention before going into a brief demo if there's enough time. So through the practice-based research of the CSIA, we've concluded that in order for the public to have meaningful oversight of automated intelligence analysis, and in order to create effective tools for countervalence, meaning protecting against or countering surveillance, and surveillance, uh, surveillance from below or watching the watchers, the public needs two main things. The literacy is to understand how these systems work and the data they produce, and the access to the data that intelligence agencies use to train their algorithms. Without this data, the results returned by the CSIA will only resemble the results and mistakes made by OSINT systems. The CSIA provides prototypes for countervalence and surveillance tools. The social media post inspector enables countervalence by showing social media users how their posts might be interpreted. The user has the option to rephrase the post and avoid algorithmic scrutiny, or even overload a post with language that creates false positives. An informed user may even decide to refrain from tweeting altogether. The CSIA watch list can be used for surveillance. Users may choose to include law enforcement, intelligence agencies, government contractors, or other members of the intelligence power elite to keep track of their posts using data valence techniques to participate in a crowdsourced and distributed watching of the watchers. The CSIA allows for experiential learning about OSINT processing, revealing some of the problems, assumptions, and oversights inherent in these technologies in order to help people understand the effectiveness of predictive policing and its impact on our privacy. The public needs to be able to ask questions about how a computer program determines if they're a threat to national security and to question the practicality of using statistical pattern recognition in place of human judgment. By reproducing the types of problems inherent in the processing and displaying of big data for intelligence analysis, the CSIA fosters a critical awareness of some of the assumptions that are inherent in data valence technology. 
by creating some of the conditions for technical and data literacy, as well as prototypes for surveillance and countervailance, the CSIA takes some of the first steps towards meaningful public oversight of OSINT surveillance. Thank you. I don't think that we have time for a demo, right? I think we probably... We need to move on. Okay, so if anyone is interested, we made a watch list for the peop some of the people that we could find that were part of this conference. So if you go to crowdsourceintel.org demo underscore watch list, you might find yourself there and you can see um, how your tweets were. Um... Whoops. Okay, so maybe I'll just show one thing very quickly. So you might be able to see um, if you're up there. Maybe we could go to this one <laughs> very quickly. Um, but so we've got our crowdsource classifier, and you can see if it was suspicious or not, the terrorist classifier, the US Intel, um, and then you can check on your tweet and learn about what our different classifiers thought of it. <laughs> we find it to be really impactful if people see their own posts because they know, of course, the context that it was posted in, what they were thinking, and you can see how it's decontextualized and then recontextualized in the program. But thank you very much. So our, ne our next presenter is Derek. Um, Derek Curry is an artist researcher whose work addresses political, social, and technological assumptions from a critical perspective. His recent work has addressed automated decision-making processes used by stock trading systems. He has replicated aspects of social media surveillance systems and has communicated with algorithmic trading bots. Curry earned his MFA in new genres from UCLA's Department of Art and his PhD from the State University of New York at Buffalo. He's currently an assistant professor at Northeastern University in Boston, where he's a dean's, no, Jesus. Yeah, you're also a dean's fellow, okay. Everybody's a dean's fellow. Uh, where he's a dean's fellow for the 2018-2019 uh, academic year. Uh, Kerry has exhibited his work in the National Adventures Arts, Arts Electronica, Science Gallery Dublin, the Athens Digital Arts Festival, the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, the AC Institute, the USF Institute for Research in Art, among others. His project, uh, like Jennifer's, have been founded by the Science Gallery in Dublin and the Buffin Foundation. So please welcome uh, Derek Curry. Um, yes, so thank you. Um, I, I also, like Jennifer, I, I really, I find this conference to be pretty awesome. Uh, it's rare that you go somewhere and every panel is something that you're, you're interested in. Um, so that's a nice change. Uh, for somebody who goes to a lot of conferences. Uh, so um, what I'm going to talk about here today is actually uh, my, the, the research coming from my uh, dissertation. Uh, and so I'm going to mostly read uh, so that I stick to the time limit. Uh, otherwise, I end up talking about uh, how high-frequency traders use microwave radio transmissions and lasers, uh, things that are pretty cool but not exactly related to um, my project, so, uh, which is called Public Dissentiment. Um, so Public Dissentiment is uh, a hacktivist art project um, that I intended to actually be used by uh, uh, protesters. Uh, it's an online application that helps protesters negatively, impasse, in, ne negatively impact the price of a publicly traded stock uh, by generating social media posts and linking to news stories that will have a strong negative sentiment when algorithmic trading bots read them. It does this by using sentiment, sentiment analysis tools uh, develop, developed for stock trading algorithms. Um, the idea is that if a large swarm of people uh, use public dissentiment all at once, or, or people that have a large following, uh, like say politicians or sometimes movie stars, um, it could create a flash crash in the stock price of a company that they're protesting. You can think of this as a lot like a 21st century boycott. Um, so I'm going to start with a short promotional video. Uh, 
uh, it's probably a, a little intense for this early in a Sunday morning, but it should give you a, a feel of what I'm trying to, to do here. Um, then I'm going to give you some background in the development of the network stock exchange, specifically the role hackers played in the development of the network stock exchange. Um, and then I'm going to end uh, with a demonstration of the project itself. So as, the, as the, uh, the project's name suggests, public dissentiment is based on uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, so we're all familiar with what sentiment analysis it is um, as it pertains to marketing or political forecasts. Uh, it's the reason why companies like Facebook are worth so much money. Uh, sometimes it's called opinion mining. And there was an explosion in sentiment analysis starting around 2001 uh, because of partially advances in natural language processing techniques. Um, but also, the internet offered this huge corpus of uh, information to start machine reading. And, and people's willingness to like things on Facebook, rate products on Amazon, or uh, give movie reviews on Netflix, um, created this, this huge training corpus uh, for a lot of deep learning support vector machines and other types of machine learning algorithms. But in finance, uh, sentiment analysis means something slightly different. Uh, it represents an opportunity for arbitrage. Sentiment in, sentiment in finance means an irrational or unfounded belief in a price. It's what people are feeling about the value of a security opposed to its actual value. 
and finance, the two poles of sentiment are fear at one end and greed at the other. Investors will irrationally sell securities for less than they should when they're experiencing fear, and they'll pay too much for a security when they're greedy. Sentiment theory in finance predicts that short-term profits will be reversed in the long run, which means there's an opportunity for arbitrage. A smart trader can buy a security when other investors are fearful and sell it back to them when they're greedy. Techniques for sentiment analysis have existed for uh, much longer in finance, and there were many different formulas for trying to measure it. These formulas usually involved a combination of factors like high yield bond returns and the, the TED spread, which is how much the US Treasury is worth versus the Euro dollar. Um, when techniques for sentiment analysis of online news stories and social media were developed from other disciplines, it immediately had this appeal to people in finance because they thought well, we could also use this for arbitrage. So sentiment analysis engines that automatically scrape news and social media are now ubiquitous in stock trading programs. There's literally hundreds of them. Major companies like the Dow Jones have them. And a lot of them promise things like help to harness the power of social media. And they even make them for mobile devices. Academic papers have compared different approaches to sentiment analysis of financial text. And most of them have found that the most accurate prediction of future stock prices are made by support vector machines trained on a corpus of financial news stories manually, labored by, manually labeled by an exceptional stock trader. Neural networks trained in the same corpus were a close second but a good training corpus made a bigger difference than any algorithm that they tried. Of course, this is all hypothetical since academics aren't actually trading in real time. Rather, they're only testing their theories using historical data and past news stories to see how a machine learning algorithm would have performed. And unlike academia, the makers of the proprietary trading software that's actually being used in the market, they don't give you their data or their algorithms. Uh, they sometimes throw on buzzwords like SVMs or neural nets, but if you do get an explanation for how it works, um, it usually looks something like this. Uh, this is the explanation for the sentiment analysis engine of Market Parse, which was the, uh, the app we saw in the previous slide. Um, and as you can see, the bird goes into the can, the can goes through a wall, uh, and then your phone gives you a stock tip. So we have a situation where at least part of the we have a situation where at least part of a decision making process is offloaded to computer programs that are completely black boxed. And it's not only the cognitive processes that are offloaded; computers execute the trades as well. Uh, only about ten percent of stock trades are currently executed by humans. Um, so how did we get to this situation? Well, uh, when automated trading first began to emerge. Major innovations came from two groups primarily. Uh, one group was mathematicians and computer scientists from industry and academia, and the other group was hackers. Um, I should say that not all of the people I'm lumping into this group of hackers uh, would consider themselves to be hackers, uh, but all of them hacked the system in one way or another, uh, and I would say that uh, within finance, like hacking has been part of it all along because you, you have this like uh, rule-based system that if you know how to manipulate a little bit here and there, you can make a lot of money. Uh, but some of them did think of themselves as hackers. Uh, in fact, Acid Freak, uh, who somewhat famously hacked AT&T's network, uh, went to work for the ECN Instanet after getting out of prison. Um, and ECN uh, is a stock trading platform that allows traders to trade directly with each other outside of a stock exchange. So it's uh, basically a stock exchange that's also more like a chat room. Um, so our first hacker is Thomas Petterfee. Uh, he's the man that's responsible for the first fully automated trade on NASDAQ. Um, he's considered to be the father of high frequency trading. Uh, the trade itself was a hack in the most literal sense. Uh, he had to cut the cable uh, to his rented NASDAQ terminal to do it. And he did this in 1987, the same year that Oliver Stone's movie Wall Street was released. Uh, so NASDAQ would release these green screen or lease these green screen terminals to brokerages uh, so traders could enter orders through a computer instead of always having to call them in on the telephone. But the process wasn't automated at all. It was kind of like uh, instant messaging or something. Um, there's people at both ends 
texting back and forth to each other. Uh, so you, on Charlie Sheen's desk, you can see an example uh, of a NASDAQ, NASDAQ green screen terminal um, that this would have been what Petterfi cut the cable to. Uh, so Petterfi had been using algorithms to trade for years, uh, but he, he always had to keep switching from his computer uh, to his terminal when he would calculate the trade and then enter it in to, to make the trade. Um, and this was costing him a lot of time, and he, he really saw no reason why the entire process couldn't be out, uh, automated. So he cut the data cable running to his rented machine and ran it through his computer to calculate the trades, then ran the cable back to the terminal so it would send off an order when it found a favorable, favorable trade. Um, so when NASDAQ saw this spike and Petterfee's trading volume, uh, they sent a, a representative there to talk to him, see what was going on. Um, and Petterfee was very proud of what he did, so he showed the NASDAQ representative his, uh, his hack. Um, and the NASDAQ representative wasn't impressed at all. In fact, he told them that the rental agreement he signed explicitly stated that all orders must be read from the screen and entered through the keyboard. And he said, you've got one week to reply. I'll be back to check on you. So in that week, uh, Petterfee hired engineer grad students engineering grad students from NYU to construct a device that would read orders from the screen and enter, enter them through a keyboard. Um, and this is a drawing of, uh, uh, that he made for the matrix of pistons that would hover over his keyboard uh, and, and punch in the, the orders once it calculated them. Uh, then he affixed a Fresnel lens and a camera to the screen of his NASDAQ terminal and wrote a program that would do uh, OCR to pull in the stock data, so he's reading it from the screen. And he essentially built a stock trading robot. When the NASDAQ representative returned, uh, he, he knew something was up uh, because Petterfee's trading volume was the same, but it was very quiet when he walked in there. And uh, typically when you have a, a trading brokers doing that kind of volume, you've got a lot of uh, big guys screaming into phones. Um, so he asked him if he complied. He said he did. And as they're walking down the hall towards where the machine was, an order came in, and it sounded like a machine gun went off because the pistons would hammer in the uh, hammer on the keys so quickly. Um, so the Nasdaq representative didn't know what to say, uh, and he was clearly upset. Um, but he also didn't force Petterfee to dismantle his trading robot. And this is how automated trading got started. Um, before I introduce the next hacker. I should probably explain what a market maker is, um, since this isn't a finance conference. Uh, market makers are traders or institutions that agree to always buy or sell a stock, no matter what the conditions of the market are. In the not too distant past, most stock exchanges function by having a designated market maker who is always willing to buy or sell a specific stock. So you'd have a market maker for Apple, Apple stock, a market maker for Intel stock, uh, and these could be the same people. You could, you could make the market in multiple stocks as long as you had enough capital reserves to, to cover all of the trades that uh, you might have to make. Um, this, this ensured that when somebody came to the exchange looking to buy or sell a stock, uh, that they could always do it. Uh, it's called providing liquidity to the market. Market makers made their money through the spread, which is the difference between the highest price they're willing to pay for a stock and the lowest price they're willing to sell it. Naturally, the price they're willing to pay for it's always lower than the price they're willing to sell it. Uh, this is how they make their money. In order for market makers to know if their buy and sell orders are in line with what other people and market makers in the same market are charging, the exchanges would give them access to the entire order book, which is all of the buy and sell orders that are waiting to be filled. So they had like this uh, like God's eye view of the market. Having the order book gave them an informational advantage over all of the other traders in that market. But it's a trade-off, because they, they have to trade even in adverse market conditions. Uh, so if the market goes into free fall and the stock's just flying downwards, they're still required to trade it. Uh, but it turns out that they didn't actually do that. Uh, and so 1987 was actually a really big year. Um, in addition to Petterfee's hack in Oliver Stone's movie, this is also the year of the Black Monday market crash. And during the Black Monday crash, market makers at NASDAQ, they simply stopped answering their phones when the market went into free fall. Uh, and this meant that some small time traders and investors lost everything, and they were understandably pissed. 
NASDAQ responded by requiring market makers to use a semi-automated system called SOAS, uh, which is an acronym for short, small, small order execution system. Um, and so it was actually part of the NASDAQ terminals already. It's just that most people didn't use it because you could only trade 500 or 1,000 shares of, of stock through them, which is usually smaller than what uh, larger institutional investors traded. But uh, requiring market makers to use SOAS and to honor the trades that are entered in, in through them um, opened the door for uh, what we call SOAS bandits. Uh, SOAS bandits were day traders that use NASDAQ's small order execution system for fast arbitrage. Uh, this is buying a block of stocks from one market maker and immediately selling it to another market maker for a profit. Most SOAS bandits were young, uh, like 18, 19 years old, and uh, not your typical Wall Street type. The average SOAS bandit wore a t-shirt and baggy jeans, this was the 90s, and a baseball cap to work. And brokerages that catered to SOAS bandits were said to have looked more like arcades than financial brokerages. The trader responsible for starting SOAS banditry was Harvey Hootkin. Hootkin was one of the traders that lost everything when the NASDAQ market makers wouldn't pick up the phones on Black Monday. Hootkin had also written his master's thesis on the network architecture of SOAS, so he knew how it worked and he knew how it could be used against market makers. Because he was so upset with the market makers at NASDAQ, who can begin giving workshops and teaching anyone who would listen to him how to become the SOAS bandit? He even wrote books about how to be a SOAS bandit from your home computer. Uh, I should also say the term bandit uh, actually came from the market makers that were losing money to them. Uh, the SOAS bandits didn't decide to start calling themselves this, but uh, Harvey Hook can embrace the term, uh, and in his books he explains where it came from. But he said he liked it. He saw so as bandits as like modern day Robin Hoods, uh, or sometimes he compared them to Zorro. So, computer programs were written to help so as bandits trade. This is one of them called Watcher. Let's see if this is playing. There we go. So, what you're seeing on the screen is what so as bandits were watching on their screens. Uh, this trader here is looking at Intel stock, uh, then he switches to Dell. Uh, the numbers in the lower left of the screen are quotes to buy and sell from various market makers. And those quotes change throughout the day. A SOAS bandit might find an instance where one market maker is offering to sell a stock at a lower price than another market maker is willing to pay for it. So when this happens, the SOAS bandit has a few minutes to quickly buy a block of 500 or 1,000 shares from one market maker and immediately offload it to the other. Watcher later incorporated features that exploited idiosyncrasies, bugs, and network latencies, allowing users of the technology and the stru <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, en enabled the users of Watcher to use uh, the network and the structure of the market to overcome the informational disadvantage they had against the market makers. Uh, so as Bendis were the direct forerunners to high frequency traders, they, they were sort of the uh, cybernetic or analog version of automated trading. The creator of the Watcher program, Josh Levine, uh, who's pictured here, he's the guy in the green sweatshirt, also created an electronic communications platform, or ECN, called Island. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, ECN allows stock traders to trade directly with each other without going through an exchange. Uh, this consequently allows them to avoid interacting with market makers altogether. In its heyday, Island came close to rivaling the trading volume of NASDAQ itself um, before it was sold to a company called Instanet, which incidentally is where Acid Freak was working. Uh, and then it was eventually bought by NASDAQ itself. And uh, uh, interestingly, a lot of the code that Devine wrote for Watcher is still running in the NASDAQ system. And he would code uh, jokes and things like that into the, uh, um, the output, uh, the debugging output of the system. And, and uh, there are things that NASDAQ programmers see and don't quite understand. Um, he also named all the protocols things like itch and ouch, and, you know, inside jokes. Um, the picture you're looking at was taken inside of Island's headquarters during the time it was becoming one of NASDAQ's biggest rivals. 
uh, this is right around the corner from the New York Stock Exchange. This would have been around 1998 or 1999. Uh, I don't have a picture of NASDAQ from that time, but I imagine it looked a little bit different. This is the facade of the headquarters, uh, which is located at 50 Broad Street. Um, and so you see what looks like a carved stone sign above the entranceway. Uh, this is actually painted styrofoam. Uh, this is a Schenectady for Island itself. In many ways, it was more like a tactical media project than a, a, a legitimate stock trading platform. Um, but Island pioneered some of the most important changes to stock trading. Uh, among these are decimalization, uh, which is pricing securities in pennies instead of eighths. Uh, pricing stocks in eighths is sort of a holdover from uh, the Spanish pieces of eight. There's no reason to use it, it's completely antiquated, but if uh, every time the stock ticks, you have to tick it up an eighth, you make a lot more money with the spread. Uh, so the market makers preferred that. Um, Island also posted all transactions publicly in real time, free of charge, making it the first lit pool, as opposed to a dark pool, You've heard of that term. Um, and this was mainly because Josh Levine subscribed to the you know, the hacker mantra, he thought that information wants to be free. And Island also created the maker-taker fee structure. In the maker-taker fee structure, the trader who places standing limit orders receives a small kickback. Uh, so a standing limit order is uh, an order to buy or sell at a specific price that uh, just sits in the order queue waiting for uh, another trader to match it. Um, the kickback is usually around one cent for every 100 shares of stock bought or sold. Uh, and these traders, they're adding liquidity to the market, so they're, they're actually taking on the role of um, the market makers. This is why they get that small rebate. On the other side, the trader's said to be taking liquidity from the market and pays a small fee, usually around two and a half cents for every 100 shares of stock bought or sold. Uh, one of the main ways that high frequency traders make their money is by collecting these one cent rebates. Under the maker-taker system, the spread for most stocks has shrunk to a penny. Uh, because of this and several other factors, which I don't really have time to go into, the SEC has introduced uh, legislation that favors ECNs and automated trading. This has been codified by the regulators. Uh, these rules, most notably, notably Regulation National Market System, or Reg NMS, as it's called in the industry, led to market makers being replaced by a system where high-frequency trading bots act as intermediaries. It's debatable whether or not high-frequency trading is more or less fair than the previous system. Um, it's probably more fair. I don't know, it's kind of like debating which is worse, capitalism or feudalism, you know, depends on what area you're living in. Um, but initially, it did make stock trading a lot cheaper uh, and allowed it to be accessible to the average person. So for a very, very small window of time, um, you could sit at home and trade stocks and compete with uh, major uh, market players. Um, but high-frequency traders quickly developed their own tactics for manipul manipulating the market. Uh, and interestingly, the, interestingly, these tactics uh, look a lot like what hackers already do. So they're similar to like DDoS attacks, IP spoofing, uh, and spamming the market with disinformation to move prices. Regulation M NMS doesn't address any of these tactics because when they started to write the law, uh, they, it wasn't really happening yet. But by the time the law was enacted in 2007, it was already obsolete in terms of the technology and the practices it was regulating. <coughs> High frequency traders make very little money on each transaction. Uh, like I said, it's usually a penny for every 100 stocks. Uh, so. They don't make very, very much money every time they trade. So they have to trade in huge, huge volumes. But it's also very, very expensive to run a high-frequency trading operation. Uh, the data feeds alone start at $20,000 a month. Um, so they can't afford to make mistakes when they're trading. This makes high-frequency traders extremely risk adverse. And unlike market makers, they're not required to trade in adverse condi conditions. If they detect any uncertainty in a the market, they simply stop trading. Uh, and this creates a complete loss of liquidity. There's no way to, for anyone to trade because there's no market makers. Uh, and the market just goes into a free fall and you get a flash crash. A flash crash is when the price of a security or sometimes even an entire index like the S&P 500 will drop very, very rapidly and then rebound. This is usually within a couple of minutes, sometimes seconds. Uh, and this drop is the result of high frequency trading bots canceling all of their orders and it just sends the market into free fall. 
Uh, and then when the price of the security almost reaches zero, uh, human traders that are monitoring the system will turn it back on, and that's where you get this, this quick rebound. <clears throat> because the profit margins for each trade on high, uh, sorry, because the profit market margins for each trade a high frequency traders makes are razor thin, remember they're only getting a penny for every 100 shares of stock they buy or sell. If the market moves against them while they're trading, they can lose money much faster than they can make it. Uh, an example is in 2011, there's a high frequency trading firm uh, called Knight Capital, and they lost $440 million in less than 30 minutes. So high frequency traders have implemented a volatility detection system that they call uh, circuit breakers. Um, so if they have any reason to believe that the market might move quickly one way or the other, they just stop and wait for, for human eyes to, to give them the go ahead. High frequency trading bots are also reading news and social media posts, uh, which is, has some interesting effects. Uh, on October, or on April 23rd, 2013, uh, hackers from the Syrian Electronic Army hacked the Associated Press's Twitter account and put out a fake tweet that said, breaking, two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. And you can see that tweet here uh, at the bottom of the slide. Um, within three minutes, the S&P 500 lost 121 billion, that, that's billion with a B, and then recovered just as quickly. Interestingly, uh, real traders knew that the tweet was fake as soon as they saw it because it said Barack Obama. The AP only refers to the president as President Obama. Uh, so if you program, you know, like implementing a check that looks for president instead of Barack is uh, completely trivial. Uh, sophomores can do this in intro to coding class. Sophomores that are probably failing can do this. Uh, but those checks take more time to calculate. And because high frequency traders make their money by being the first to the trade. They don't have time to look and see if things are accurate. So accuracy is not part of what they're doing at all. Uh, they're only looking for possible volatility. So learning about this hack uh, is what eventually led me to the idea that you could use financial sentiment analysis uh, in Twitter in a tactical way. Uh, the sentiment analysis engine in public dissentiment is actually built first for another project called emotional stress test. Uh, emotional stress test uses a galvanic skin response sensor uh, that I retrofitted with an Arduino uh, to detect when the user was experiencing stress. And if the user's stress level was going way up, it would post tweets about financial institutions responsible for the 2008 crash and the LIBOR rate fixing scandal. Here's an example of some of the tweets from the project. The words in the tweet came from the news stories that had strong, the strongest negative sentiment. Uh, the tweet would also link to the news stories where the words came from, uh, so that if you had any uh, high frequency trading bots crawling links that they find, they would, they would find these negative stories. Um, so when I first started the project, I began uh, building a support vector based sentiment analysis engine because this was supposed to be the best performing uh, sentiment analysis engine, um, but this this actually meant I had to read tens of thousands of news stories and manually label them as positive or negative. And uh, since I'm not a professional stock trader, that's <coughs> wasn't quite sure if I was doing it right. Uh, but then I found a financial sentiment lexicon uh, that was made by two researchers at Notre Dame, uh, Tim Logren and Bill McDonald, and their research showed that a lexicographic sentiment analysis approach that used their corpus only slightly underperformed the support vector sentiment analysis engine trained in a corpus of uh, manually labeled Reuters news stories uh, that was created by professional stock traders. Uh, so since I didn't and still don't have access to professional stock traders, I decided it might be a little more prudent if I switched to uh, a lexicographic approach using their corpus. So here's some sam a sample of some of the negative words from the corpus. Um, it's actually about 8,000 negative words and 8,000 positive words in the entire corpus. But you might notice that some of the words seem bad, uh, and then some of them seem rather innocuous, and some of them seem almost good. Uh, for example, see there's B in backdating, and E in easing. Uh, so backdating is when a company's past records are changed to reflect an actual profit uh, that was different than the profit they initially reported. Uh, this almost always means that the company made less money than it reported initially and they got caught. 
Uh, easing literally means to make something unpleasant or painful less intense uh, or less serious. But in financial terms, this means that a company's in financial trouble and regulators are taking measures to help them get out of that trouble. So as soon as I started testing emotional stress test, uh, I started to be followed by uh, stock traders on Twitter. Uh, these are most likely other bots. <coughs> And I started to get notifications from the uh, aforementioned market parse uh, that my tweet had a sentiment of negative five. Um, so negative five is actually very low for uh, sentiment on Twitter. It's typically plus or minus one um, because you only have 140 characters to express sentiment, so it's hard to be super negative. Um, but so th these tweets, the tweets I was making from uh, this project were, were part of the bird that goes into the can. And this brings us to public dissentiment. So on the back end of public dissentiment, it's a database that's being filled with news stories that are selected for their negative sentiment. The stories are collected using a web crawler that performs sentiment analysis using a program I built using the lexicon from Logran and McDonald. Um, just a side note here, so when I'm you know, filling these databases, uh, I, I have it outputting uh, the, the words that it finds in the story, so I can make sure that it's working right. Uh, and investment banks by far have the worst words. Um, and of investment banks, HSBC is by far the worst. Uh, with, <laughs> with HSBC, uh, you see words like racketeering, murder, drug cartel. Um, this is partially because of, uh, about six years ago they were caught um, aiding Mexican drug cartels. Uh, so the the negative sentiment for HSBC is like negative 90 sometimes. It's, it's ridiculously bad. Uh, when you find a story that you might want to post, uh, the app will give you a summary of it. Uh, the, the summary is actually algorithmically generated as well uh, using the uh, Python newspaper module. Uh, and every post generated by the app is based on a real news story. So users of the app can't be accused of creating or distributing disinformation. The user of the app then selects their preferred social media outlet. Twitter's the most commonly used by financial institutions, so if you're gonna do it, I'd suggest using Twitter. Uh, the SEC's even declared that Twitter and Facebook uh, are outlets that meet the requirements of fair disclosure. Uh, so companies now tweet information they're required to disclose publicly, so uh, you can be sure that algorithmic trading bots are reading Twitter. And the app will give you three suggestions for possible social media posts that use all of the words uh, found in the news story and allow you to edit that post uh, or write your own. Uh, if you're using Twitter, be sure to include the cash tag, uh, which is the dollar sign followed by the stock ticker symbol uh, for the company you're, you're writing about. This is how algorithmic trading bots and sometimes human stock traders know you're, you're talking about uh, uh, financial information, information that could impact the market. Um, the app has buttons that will automatically insert a cash tag for you and a link to the news story and buttons for all of the negative words found in the story. Um, so it's important to me that the, uh, the app's mobile friendly so it can be used in conjunction with on-site protests. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the first stock that was requested to be added uh, was Energy Transfer Partners. So if you, if you go to the app and you're trying to protest a company and you don't see its ticker symbol yet, you can just add it. And, It'll start collecting stories for it. Um, the first one was Energy Transfer Partners. This is the company building the Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, this is a pipeline that's running between the US and Canada through uh, land that's owned by Native Americans. So there's a lot of people upset about this. Uh, a couple weeks after the stock was requested, the stock price of Energy Transfer Partners did drop, uh, and the stock became very volatile. Um, Unfortunately, it's really difficult for me to tell how much of that I can attribute to the app uh, because I'm not saving any of the information, uh, of any user information for it. Um, it's, this made it really hard for me to use this uh, for my academic research. Um, but uh, so even though tweets and news stories, the, the, the tweets are based off of real news stories, so this isn't fake stuff designed directly to manipulate the market. But um, I don't know how it is everywhere else, but in the US, uh, sometimes it just doesn't matter. Protesters are often arrested for whatever reason, and they let the courts figure it out, and I just didn't want to be responsible for that. So I opted, to, uh, I opted for the safety of the users rather than 
helping my own research. And so that's it. Do we have time for a, a demo or are we over time? Or I'm not sure where we're at. I'll show you real quick. Uh, let's do a protest. So this is this is the app. We have one minute. One minute? Okay, that's more than enough time. Uh, and let's just pick a company. Let's try. And here you are. Uh, so you can sort this uh, according to the sentiment. You can sort it according to the date. Uh, and if you pick a pick a story and it looks good, um, you can create a post. We we'll use Twitter. Now, if you if you um, if you'd like to use this for real, the best way to do it is to have a few people make a post. I'll just use this. And then once, once that person makes a post, or a few people make a post, refresh it. There we go. You have the other protesters retweet it, and that'll actually uh, push it up in, in Twitter's timeline. So uh, that's it. Thank you.